Where are Elmer, Herman, Bert, Tom, and Charlie? The, the weak, weak of will, will, the strong of arm, the clown, the, the boozer, boozer, the fighter. All, all are sleeping on the hill. One passed Pass in, in a, a fever. fever. One was burned in a mine. One, one was, was killed in a brawl. One died in jail. jail. One fell from a bridge toiling for, for children and wife. All, all are sleeping, 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 sleeping on the hill. Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lucy, and Edith? Edith? The tender heart, the simple soul, the, the loud, loud, the proud, the happy one? All, all, all are, are sleeping on the hill. One died in a shameful childbirth, one of a thwarted love. One, one at, at the hands of a brute in a brothel. One of broken pride in the search for heart's desire. Dire. One after life in far away London, London and Paris. And Paris was brought to her little space by Ella and Kate, Kate and, and Mac. Mac. All, all are sleeping, 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 sleeping on the hill. We, we the memories, stand about this place and shield our eyes for we dread to read. June 17th, 1884, 21 years and three days. And we, we the memories, Stand here for ourselves alone, for no eye marks us nor knows why we're here. Your husband is dead, your sister lives far away, your father is bent with age, he has forgotten you. He scarcely leaves the house anymore. It is all forgotten, save by us, the memories who are forgotten by the world. And all has changed, save the river and the hill. Even they are changed. Only the chemist can tell, not always the chemist. What will result from compounding fluids or solids? And who can tell how men and women will interact on each other? Or what children will result? There were Benjamin Pantier and his wife, good in themselves, but evil toward each other. Together in this grave lie Benjamin Pantier, attorney at law, and Nig, his dog, constant companion, solace, and friend. Down the gray road, friends, children, men, and women, passing one by one out of life, left me till I was alone with Nig for partner. In the morning of life, I knew aspiration and saw glory. I know he told you that I snared his soul with a snare that bled him to death. All the men loved him and all the women pitied him. But suppose you really are a lady with delicate tastes and you loathe the smell of whiskey and onions and the rhythm of Wordworth's ode runs through your ears. When he goes about from morning till night, repeating bits of the common things. Oh, why should the spirit of the mortal be proud? Then she, who survives me, snared my soul with a snare which bled me to death, till I once strong of will lay broken and different. Living with Nig in a room back of a dingy office. But suppose you really are a woman, well endowed, and the only man that the law and morality permit you to have marital relations is the very man that fills you with disgust. Every time you think of it, or you think of it, every time you look at him. That's why I sent him away to live with his dog in a dingy room back of his office. Under my jawbone is snuggled the bony nose of Nig. Our story is lost in silence. Goodbye, mad world. Good in themselves, but evil toward each other. He oxygen, she hydrogen. 
their son, a devastating fire. I, trainer the druggist, mixer of chemicals, killed while making an experiment, lived unwedded. If you in the village think that my work was a good one, who closed all the saloons and stopped all playing at cards, and many a crusade to purge the people of sin, why do you let the milliner's daughter Dora and the worthless son of Benjamin Pantier nightly make my grave their unholy pillow? When Reuben Pantier ran away and threw me, I went to Springfield. There I met a lush whose father, recently deceased, left him a fortune. He married me while drunk. My life was wretched. So after about a year, one day they found him dead. That made me rich. I moved to Chicago. After some time, I met Tyler Rontree, villain. I moved to New York. A gray-haired magnet went mad about me. So, another fortune. He died one night, right in my arms, you know. I saw his purple face for years thereafter. There was almost a scandal. I moved on, this time to Paris. I was now a woman, insidious, subtle, versed in the world and rich. My sweet apartment near the Champs-Élysées became a center for all sorts of people. Musicians, poets, dandies, artists, nobles. We spoke German, French, Italian, and English. And I wed Count Navigato, native of Genoa, and we went to Rome. And he poisoned me, I think. Now in the Campo Santo, overlooking the sea where young Columbus dreamed new worlds, see what they chiseled. Contessa Navigato in plore y tierna cuyete. I was the milliner, talked about, lied about, mother of Dora, whose strange disappearance was charged to her rearing. My eye, quick to beauty, saw much besides ribbons and buckles and feathers and leghorns and felts to set off sweet faces and dark hair and gold. The stealers of husbands wore powder and trinkets and fashionable hats. Wives, wear them yourselves. Hats may make a divorce. They also prevent them. She loved me. Oh, how she loved me. I never had a chance to escape from the day she first saw me. But then we were married, and I thought that she might divorce me and, and let me out, or she might prove her mortality. But few die, and I'm resigned. And then I was gone on a year in a lark. But she said, oh, it would be fine, that I would return. And I did return. He ran away and was gone for a year. When he came back, he told me the silly story of being kidnapped by pirates on Lake Michigan and being kept in chains so he could not write me. I pretended to believe him, though I knew very well what he was doing, and that he met the milner, Miss Williams, now and then, when she went to the city to buy goods, as she said. I told her that while taking a row in a boat, I'd been captured by pirates on near Van Buren Street on Lake Michigan, and kept in chains so I could not write her. But a promise is a promise, and marriage is marriage. And out of respect for my own character, I refuse to be drawn into divorce by the scheme of a husband who has simply grown tired of his marital vow and duty. She cried and kissed me, said it was outrageous, cruel, inhuman. I then concluded that our marriage was a divine dispensation. I cannot be dissolved, except through death. I was right. You would not believe, would you, that I came from good Welsh stock, that I was purer blooded than the white trash here, and of more direct lineage than the New Englanders and Virginians of Spoon River? You would not believe that I had been to school and had read some books. You saw me only as a rundown man, with matted hair and a beard and ragged clothes. Sometimes a man's life turns into a cancer from being bruised and continually bruised, like growths on stalks of corn. Here was I, a carpenter, mired in a bog of life, into which I walked thinking it was a meadow, with a slattern for a wife, and poor Minerva, 
my daughter, whom you tormented and drove to death. No other man, unless it was Doc Hill, did more for the people in this town than I. And all the weak, the halt, the improvident, and those who could not pay flocked to me. I was good-hearted, easy Dr. Myers. I was healthy, happy, in comfortable fortune, blessed with a congenial mate, my children raised, all doing well in the world. And then, one night, Minerva, the poetess, she came to me in her troubles, crying. I'm Minerva Jones, the village poetess, who would have jeered at by the yaws of the street. For my heavy body, cockeye and rolling walk, and all the more when Butch Welly captured me after a brutal hunt. He left me to my fate with Dr. Myers, and I died, going up numb from the feet up, like someone stepping deeper and deeper into a stream of ice. I tried to help her out. She died. Th they indicted me. The newspapers disgraced me. My, my wife perished of a broken heart. And pneumonia finished me. He protested all his life long. The newspapers lied about him villainously. That he was not at fault for Minerva's fall, but he only tried to help her. Poor soul, so sunk in sin, he could not see that, even trying to help her, as he called it, he had broken the law, human and divine. Passerby, an ancient admonition to you, if your ways would be ways of pleasantness and all your pathways peace, love God and keep his commandments. Can someone please go down to the village newspaper and gather into a book the verses I wrote? I hungered so for life. I thirsted so for love. And so I crept, crept like a snail through the days of my life. No more will you hear my footsteps in the morning, resounding off the hollow sidewalk, going to the grocery store for a little cornmeal and a nickel's worth of bacon. That was the first fruits of the Battle of Missionary Ridge. When I felt the bullet enter my heart, I wish I'd stayed at home and gone to jail for seeing those hogs of Curl Trenere instead of running away and joining the army. I was William Metcalf. They used to call me Dr. Myers because they said I looked like him. And he was my father, according to Jack McGuire. I lived in the livery stable, sleeping on the floor side by side with Roger Bowman's bulldog, or sometimes in a stall. I could crawl between the legs of the wildest horses without getting kicked. We knew each other. On spring days, I tramped through the country to get the feeling, which I sometimes lost that I was not a separate thing from the earth. I used to lose myself, as if in sleep, by lying with eyes half open in the woods. Sometimes I talked with animals, even toads and snakes, anything that had an eye to look into. Once I saw a stone in the sunshine trying to turn into jelly. In April days in this cemetery, the dead people gathered all about me, and grew still, like a congregation in silent prayer. I never knew whether I was a part of the earth with flowers growing in me, or whether I walked. Now I know. Nolt Hoheimer went off to the war the day before Carl Trenary swore out a warrant with Justice Arnett for stealing hogs. But that's not the reason he became a soldier. He caught me running with Lucius Atherton. We quarreled and I told him never again to cross my path. Then he stole the hogs and ran off to the war. Back of every soldier's a woman. rather a thousand times the county jail than to lie under this marble figure with wings bearing the words pro patria what do they even mean anyway i was not beloved of the villagers but all because i spoke my mind and met those who transgressed me with pure remonstrance hiding nor nurturing nor secret griefs nor grudges that act of the Spartan boy is greatly praised, who hid the wolf under his cloak and let it devour him uncomplainingly. But it is braver, I think, 
to snatch the wolf forth and fight it openly, even in the street, amid dust and howls of pain. The tongue may be an unruly member, but silence poisons the soul. Berate me who will, I am content. I would have been as great as George Eliot, but for a untoward fate. For look at this photograph of me made by Pennywit, chin resting on hand and deep set eyes, gray too and far searching. But there's the old, old problem, whether it be celibacy, matrimony, or unchastity. Then John Slack wooed me, luring me with his promise of leisure for my novel, and I married him, giving birth to eight children, having no time for my writing. It was all over for me when I ran my, the needle through my finger and died from locked jaw, an ironical death. Hear me, ambitious souls. Sex is the curse of life. Over and over they used to ask me, will buying the wine or the beer in Pura first, then later in Chicago, Denver, Frisco, where I, and New York, and wherever I lived, how I happened to lead the life and what was the cause of it? Well, I told them, silk dress and a promise of marriage to a rich man, it was Lucius Atherton. But that wasn't really it at all. Suppose a boy steals an apple from the tray at the grocery store, and they all begin to call him a thief. The editor, the minister, the judge, and all the people. A thief, a thief, a thief wherever he goes, and he can't get work, and he can't get bread without stealing it. Why, the boy will steal. It's the way the people regard the theft of the apple that makes the boy what he is. When my mustache curled and my hair was black, and I wore tight trousers and a diamond stud, I was an excellent knave of hearts and took many a trick. But when the gray hair started to set in, lo, a new generation of girls laughed at me, not fearing me, and I had no more exciting adventures, wherein I was all but shot for a heartless devil, only worn over affairs, drabby affairs of other days and other men. And as time went on, until I lived at Mayer's restaurant, or taking in short orders, a gray, untidy, toothless, discarded rural Don Juan. Often ain't a clute at the gate, forbid me the parting kiss, saying that we should be engaged before that. And with a distant clasp of the hand, she bade me a good night. As I brought her home from the skating ring or the revival, no sooner did my departing footsteps die away than Lucius Atherton. So I learned when Aner went to Peoria, stolen at the window, took her riding behind a spanking team of bays into the country. The shock of it made me settle down. I took all the money I got from my father's estate and put it into the canned factory. I got the job of head accountant and lost it all. And then I knew I was one of life's fools, whom death would only treat as equal to other men, making me feel like a man. I belong to the church and to the party of prohibition, and the villagers thought I died from eating watermelon. In truth, I had cirrhosis of the liver. For every noon for 30 years, I slipped behind the prescription partition in Trainer's Drugstore, where I poured myself a generous drink from the bottle labeled Spiritus Fermente. I inherited 40 acres from my father, and by working my wife, my two sons, and two daughters, from dawn to dusk, I acquired 1,000 acres. But, not content, wishing to own 2,000 acres, I bustled through the year with axe and plow, toying, denying myself, my wife, my sons, my daughters. Squire Higby wrongs me to say that I died from smoking Red Eagle cigars. Eating hot pie and gulping coffee on the scorching hours of harvest time brought me here, here. I had reached my 60th year. The earth keeps some vibration going there in your heart, and that is you. And if the people find you can fiddle, 
Oh, why, Fiddle, you must for all your life. What is here a bustle of clover or a meadow to walk through to the river? The winds and the corn, rub your hands together for beeves hereafter ready for market. Or else you hear the rustle of skirts like girls dancing at Little Grove. Jacuni Potter, a pillar of dust or whirling leaves means ruinous drought. It looked to me like Redhead Sammy stepping it off to Tulur. How could I plow my 40 acres, not speak of getting more, with the melody of horns, bassoons, and piccolos stirred in my brain, with the crows and robins and the creak of the windmill? Only these? And I never plowed in my life that someone did not stop on the road and take me away to dance or picnic. I ended up with 40 acres. I ended up with a broken fiddle, and a broken laugh, and a thousand memories, and not a single. I have studied many times the marble for which was chiseled for me, but with the furled sail at rest in the harbor. In truth, it pictures not my destination, but my life. For love was offered me, and I shrank from its disillusionment. Our own knocked at my door, and I was afraid. Ambition called me, but I dreaded the chances. Yet all the while, I hungered meaning in my life. And now I know we must lift the sail and catch the winds of destiny ever they drive the boat. To put meaning in one's life may end in madness, but life without meaning is the torture of restlessness and vague desire. It is about longing for the sea, and yet afraid. I, born in Weimar, of a mother who is French and a German father, a most learned professor, orphaned at 14 years, became a dancer known as Russian Sonia. All up and down the boulevards of Paris, mistress betimes of sundry dukes and counts, and later of poor artists and of poets. At forty years, passé, I sought New York, and met old Patrick Hummer on the boat, red-faced and hale, who turned his sixtieth year, returning after having sold a shipload of cattle in the German city Hamburg. He brought me to Spoon River, and we lived there for twenty years, they thought we were married. <laughs> this oak tree near me is the favorite haunt of the Blue Jays, chattering, chattering all the day. And why not? For my very dust is laughing at for thinking of the humorous thing called life. Had the excursion train to Peoria just been wrecked, I might have escaped with my life. Certainly I should have escaped this place, but it was burned as well and they mistook my body for John Allen, and John for me. So he got to be buried at the Hebrew Cemetery at Chicago. So I lie here. It was bad enough to run a clothing store in this town, but to be buried here? <laughs> I preached 4,000 sermon, conducted 40 revivals, and baptized many converts, but there is no deed of mine that shines brighter in the world and none treasured by myself. Look how I saved the blisses from divorce and kept the children from that disgrace to grow up into men and women, happy themselves, a credit to the village. Reverend Wiley advised me not to divorce him for the sake of the children and Judge Summers advised him the same. So he stuck it to the end of the path but two of the children thought he was right, and two of the children thought I was right. And the two who sided with him blamed me, and the two who sided with me blamed him, and they grieved for the one they sided with. And all were torn with the guilt of judging, and tortured in soul, because they could not admire equally him and me. Now every gardener knows that plants grown in cellars or under stones are twisted, yellow, and weak. And no mother would let her baby suck diseased milk from her breast. Yet preachers and judges advise the raising of souls where there is no sunlight, but only twilight, no warmth, but only dampness and cold. Preachers and judges. There's something about death like love itself. If with someone whom you've known great passion in the glow of youthful love, you also, after years of life together, feel the sinking of the fire and thus fade away together. Gradually, faintly, delicately, as if it were in each other's arms, passing from a familiar room. 
that. It's a power of unison between souls like, like love, love itself. itself. Almost the shell of a woman after the surgeon's knife. In almost a year to creep back to strength. To the dawn of my wedding decennial found me my seeming self again. We walked the forest together by a path of soundless moss and turf. But I could not look in your eyes, and you could not look in my eyes. For such sorrow was ours, the beginning of gray in your hair, and I but a shell of myself. And what did we talk of? Sky and water, anything most to hide our thoughts. And your gift of wild roses, set on the table to grace our dinner. Poor heart, how bravely you struggled to imagine and live a remembered rapture. Then my spirit drooped as the night came on. And you left me alone in my room for a while, as you did when I was a bride, poor heart. And I looked in the mirror, and something said, one should be all dead when one is half dead, nor ever mock life, nor ever cheat love. And I did it there looking in the mirror. Dear, have you ever understood? To the next generation, I would say, memorize a bit of verse of truth or beauty. It may serve a turn in your life. My husband had nothing to do with the fall of the bank. He was only cashier. The wreck was due to Thomas Rhodes, the president, and his vain, unscrupulous son. Yet my husband was sent to jail, and I was left alone with the children to feed and clothe and school them. And so I did it, and sent them forth into the world, all clean and strong, and all through the wisdom of Pope, the poet. Act well your part, there all the honor lies. Passerby, to love is to find your soul in the soul of the beloved one. When the beloved one withdraws from your soul, you have lost your soul. It is written, I have a friend, but my sorrow has no friend. When I went to the city, Mary McNeely, I meant to return for you. Yes, I did. But Laura, my landlady's daughter, stole into my life somehow and won me away. Hence my long years of solitude at the home of my father, trying to get myself back and to turn my sorrow into a supremer self. But there was my father with his sorrow sitting under the cedar tree, a picture that sank its way into my heart, bringing infinite repose. Then, after some years, whom should I meet? But Georgine Minner, from Niles, a sprout of the free love gardens that flourished before the war all over Ohio. Her dilettant lover had tired of her, and she turned to me for strength and solace. She was some kind of crying thing, one takes into one's arms and all at once again. It slimes your face with its running nose and voids its essence all over you, and bites your hand and springs away, and leaves you standing there, smelling to heaven. O oh, ye souls who have made life fragrant and white as two roses from the earth's dark soul, eternal peace. Why, Mary McNeely, I was not worthy to kiss the hem of your robe. I lost my patronage at Spoon River from trying to put my mind in the camera to capture the soul of the person. The very best photo I ever took was of Judge Somers, attorney at law. He sat upright and had me pause till he got his cross eye straight. Then, when he was ready, he said, all right. And I yelled, overruled, and his eye turned up and I caught him just as he used to look when saying, I accept. When I first came to Spoon River, I did not know what they told me was true or false. They would bring me the epitaph and stand around the shop while I worked and say, He was so kind. He was so wonderful. She was the sweetest woman. He was a consistent Christian. And I chiseled for them whatever they wished, all in the ignorance of the truth. I was a peasant girl from Germany. Blue-eyed. Rosie, 
happy, and strong. And the first place I worked was at Thomas Green's. One on a summer's day, he stole into the kitchen and took me in his arms, kissed me on the throat. I, turning my head. Then neither of us seemed to know what happened. And I cried for what would become of me, and cried and cried as my secret began to show. One day, Mrs. Green said she understood and would make no trouble for me, and being childless would adopt it. I was the only child of Francis Harris of Virginia and Thomas Green of Kentucky, of valiant and honorable blood both. To them, I owe all that I became, judge, member of Congress, leader in the state. So she hid in the house and sent out rumors as if it were going to happen to her. All went well and the child was born. They were so kind to me. From my mother, I inherited vivacity, fancy, language. From my father, will, judgment, logic. All honor to them for what service I was to the people. But then sitters by at the rally thought that I was crying at the eloquence of Hamilton Green. That was not it. No, I wanted to say, that is my son. That is my son. But later, as I lived among the people here, I knew how near to life the epitaphs that are ordered for them as they died. But still, I chiseled whatever they paid me to chisel and made myself party upon the false chronicles of the stones, even as a historian does who writes without knowing the truth, or because he's influenced to hide it. My name used to be in the papers daily as having dined somewhere or traveled somewhere or rented a house in Paris where I entertained the nobility. I was forever eating or traveling, or taking the cure at the Baden-Baden. And now I'm here to do honor, to Spoon River besides the family whence I sprang. No one cares now where I've dined or lived, or who I've entertained, or how often I took the cure at the Baden-Baden. My parents thought I would be as great as Edison, or greater. For as a boy, I made balloons, and wondrous kites, and toys with clocks, and little engines with tracks to run on, and telephones with cans and thread. I played the cornet, and painted pictures, modeled in clay, and took the part of the villain in the octoroon. But at twenty-one, I married, and had to live, so... To live, I learned the art of making watches and kept my jewelry store on the square. Thinking, 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 thinking not of business, but of the engine I studied the calculus to build. And all Spoon River watched and waited to see it work, but it never worked. And a few kind souls believed my genius was somehow hampered by the store. It was not true. The truth was, I did not have the brains. When I died, the circulating library, which I built up for Spoon River, and managed for the good of the inquiring mind, was sold at auction on the public square, as if to destroy the last visage of my memory and influence. For those of you who could not see the, the virtue of knowing Volney's ruins as well as Butler's analogy and Faust as well as Evangeline. You were the power in the village and would often ask me, what is the use of knowing the evil in the world? I am out of your way now, Spoon River. Choose your own good and call it good, for I can never make you see that no one can know what is good who knows not what is evil, and no one can know what is true who's, who knows not what is false.
Your red blossoms of mid-green leaves are drooping beautiful geranium, but you do not ask for water. You cannot speak. You do not need to speak. Everyone knows you are dying of thirst, yet they do not bring water. They pass on, saying, the geranium wants water. And I, who had happiness to share, and longed to share your happiness, I who loved you, Spoon River, and craved your love, withered before your eyes, Spoon River, thirsting, thirsting, voiceless from chasteness of soul to ask you for love, you who knew and saw me perish before you, like this geranium which someone has planted over me and left to die. Those is nothing but the hive, that they're drones and workers, and a queen, and nothing but storing honey, for the next generation, this whole generation never living. Accept it as it swarms in the sunlight of youth, strengthening its wings over what it has gathered, tasting on the way to the hive, from the clover field, the delicate spoil. I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played snap out at Winchester. One time we were driving home in the moonlight of middle June, and there I found Davis. We were married and lived together for 70 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom we lost ere I reached the age of 60. Suppose all this and suppose the truth, that the nature of man is greater than one's need in the hive, and as you bear the burden of life and the urge from your spirit's success. I spun, I wove, I made the house, I kept the garden, I nursed the sick, and for holiday rambled over the fields where sang the larks, and by Spoon River collecting many a shell and many a flower medicinal weed, shouting to the wooded hills, singing to the green valleys. At 96, I had lived enough, that is all, and passed to a sweet repose. I always say, to live it out like a god, serve a mortal life, though in doubt is the way to live it. What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes? Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. And if that doesn't make God proud, then God is nothing but gravitation, or sleep is the golden goal. It takes life to love life. At first you will not know, and you may never know, and we may never tell you. These sudden flashes in your soul, like lambent lightning on snowy clouds at midnight when the moon is full. They come in solitude, or perhaps you sit with your friend, and all at once a silence falls on speech and his eyes, without a flicker, glow at you. You two have seen the secret together. He sees it in you, and you in him. And you sit there, thrilling less to the mystery that stand before you and strike you dead. With a splendor like the sun's, be brave. For all souls who have such visions, as your body's alive, as mine is dead. You're catching a little whiff of ether reserved for God himself. It is all forgotten, save by us. The memories were forgotten by the world, and all has changed save the river and the hill. Even they are changed. Only the burning sun and quiet stars are the same. And we, we the memories, stand here in awe. 